Hide tanning for me came out of a desire to try to use more of the animal and to limit what went to waste. I've been tanning hides for about 10 years or so at this point and it was a process that I didn't know if I would actually like it or if I'd be disgusted by it. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty for real process. But what the experience ended up being for me was less about learning this new skill and more like a deep sense of remembering. I felt this incredible connection to so many people who have gone before me, connection to the past and to my own ancestry. Yeah, and a lot of this for me connects back to hunting. To hunt you have this incredible connection to the animal and so you're reminded of that when you tan the hide and you're reminded of that when you wear those clothes and when you use that bag. There are a lot of different types of hunters in the world, whether you're super old school or maybe you're more of the wool and canvas type traditionalist, or maybe you're the modern archer, or maybe you're the fully modern kitted out rifle hunter. No matter how you dress or how you hunt, if you're a hunter, we all need the same skills. And so if you're gonna bring an animal home, we're gonna help you learn what to do with it. Today we are going to begin the process of hide tanning. It's important to know how to store your hide so that you can pick up with this process again with me in the spring when we get into turning hides like this into hides that look like this. The more you can make the next step in the hide tanning process easier for yourself, the better for the hawk. This is the tool, I'm just gonna take them off. So if you're skinning for hide tanning, take your time, do a good job, minimal knife work, use your hands as much as possible to, to pull the hide off, uh, and you'll come away with a much cleaner hide. There are a lot of ways to do this. I'm going to show you wet scrape, hair off, buckskin. If you follow the steps that I show you, you will get from a hide that just came off the animal to very nice buckskin. This is the tool that I prefer for uh, both fleshing and graining. A modified planer blade. The handles come off for ease of cleaning. But what's really important about this is it is a double beveled edge. So it's beveled at about a 45 and then taken pretty flat on the end. It is not sharp. You do not want this sharp. For fleshing particularly, I am not cutting the meat and the fat off. I am pushing it off, rolling it off. You can use a pull beam or a push beam. I prefer the push beam because it's what I'm used to. You may prefer the pull beam. With a pull beam, you lean this against a tree or a building and you pinch the hide behind it and you're using the tool to work the material down, pulling. With a push beam, I built this push beam out of PVC. Uh, a lot of people don't like PVC because it's not a natural material. Uh, wood is another fantastic option. You can smooth it down a log, make a support for it. It works great. The downside to wood is in the graining process, which we will get to later, the beam can get wet. And if it gets wet, it gets spongy 
and you don't have a hard surface to work against. PVC for me is great because it's easy to clean uh, and it stays solid and so I have a better working surface. I orient the hide with the tail at the bottom, the neck at the top, and I'm going to keep the hide in place by leaning up against it. So I'm putting like the top of my thigh against the beam to hold this in place and then I'm going to work away from myself. I'm taking off fat, so I do need to squeegee the blade. It works well with fleshing to kind of work down the spine and then push things more towards the edges. And when I come to an edge, I want to work parallel to that edge. I don't want to be perpendicular to the edge because I can grab the edge and rip it. And your, your hide is going to move a lot. It's going to slip off the beam, you're going to have to reorient it, get it where you need to. Um, that happens all the time. So that's not a big deal. All right, let's salt. If you go to the grocery store and buy salt like this, it's gonna cost you a dollar, dollar fifty, something like that. But if you go to the feed store and buy this, you can get 50 pounds for about five or six bucks. This is the way to go. What you want is fine grain, non-iodized salt. So I want to work this salt into the hide. Try to just get a good layer all the way around. You want to watch out for your hide folding over. Uh, it's going to be really, really important to pay attention to edges. If you don't get it into the edges, uh, you can get these folds, and that is where rot is going to happen. So you want to really get it out into the edges really well. Salt works really well because it inhibits bacterial growth, and the salt is going to draw moisture out of this hide. It's amazing how quick it happens. Like it's, the salt is already drawing, drawing moisture out of this hide. So the next step is to fold it in half along the spine line and match up flesh to flesh. Moisture cannot drain out of here because that's where the fold is, but moisture can drain out of here. And so I will fold this hide Keep matching flesh to flesh, fold it over, and now I can put this hide away to drain, and I'll tip it so it'll be on an angle so that all of the fluid that's drawn out by the salt will run out of the hide, and then it'll preserve better. I'm gonna cover them over with the tarp because they're not protected under here very well anymore, and that will keep them good and out of the rain and out of the snow store these for just a week or so. That'll do. Once they have drained, then I can put them in a bag and I label them size, quality, um, what they are, whether they're an elk or a deer, white tail, mule deer, whatever, and then bag them up and they live in here until I can get to them. I have been fascinated with traditional skills since I was a little kid. I know what that feels like to want to do this thing, to want to engage in this transformational process that takes a hide off of an animal and turns it into something beautiful. There is no greater sacrifice that a creature can give than its life for your sustenance. The desire to use more of the animal comes from a place of really wanting to honor that sacrifice. Honor that to the greatest degree that you are able, whatever that may look like. I'm certainly not to a point where I use everything, but I'm trying year by year to use more, to learn more how to use all of what comes from harvesting an animal.